The focus of today's video material is on macroevolution, in other words, the creation of new species. Now in class so far, you've watched a couple videos that have talked about the process of speciation and have also done some activities that have involved studying speciation, but I want to talk about a couple other aspects in the material today. First of all, we haven't really talked too much about what a species is. It turns out that there are several different concepts for what a species is, and in your activity earlier this week, you dealt with both biological species concepts, morphological species concepts, and phylogenetic species concepts. For all of those species concepts, and it turns out that there are probably about 12 or 15 different species concepts, for each one of those species concepts you could define a species in a different way. So the commonly accepted one is the biological species concept, which requires that species not be able to interbreed and produce viable or equally fit offspring. But there are lots of other species definitions out there and species concepts out there, and so you always have to be careful which species concept you're using. Once you figure out what a species is, then the question of macroevolution or how species come about is this fundamental question of speciation. How do species originate? When species can no longer produce viable offspring, then according to the biological species concept, they are different species. So in essence then, speciation is the evolution of reproductive isolation between once interbreeding populations. How that happens is through the evolution or creation of reproductive isolating barriers. What we'll do in class is talk about several different kinds of reproductive isolating barriers or reproductive isolating mechanisms or RIMs, but for now I want to give you a little bit of background in this process of speciation. So then if this is the issue for what speciation is, then macroevolution, or the creation of new species, just boils down to the question of how does reproductive isolation get achieved. Just a brief review first. There are a couple modes of speciation. There's allopatric speciation, and that could either happen because of colonization or vicariant speciation. You should review the activity that we did earlier this week if you're unclear on these. The book also has some definitions for what these are. Another form of speciation is sympatric speciation. And in sympatric speciation, the two species are formed in the same habitat. Again, review the activity in the book for this material. With dispersal and colonization speciation, or with vicariance speciation, in both cases, there's got to be some isolation, a physical geographic isolation. One other component here is that when a population colonizes a new island or a new habitat, like on the figure on the left, then what's happening here is the island is colonized by a very small number of individuals. Remember when drift is really important? Yep, small population sizes. So that's going to turn out to be important in just a little bit. So here are some of the typical steps in allopatric speciation. First, there's got to be some isolation geographically, and that's what I showed you in that cartoon in the previous slide. Then there has to be a lot of time, and during that time, there's divergence. Now, typically we think of selection being a really strong force in leading to the divergence of these two populations. But especially if a new population is founded on an island, then drift can have a really, really important role for this divergence of populations. In fact, it's believed that drift is the more important factor leading to divergence in isolated populations. Finally, there has been reproductive isolation that gets achieved. So in other words, once these populations come back into secondary contact, they're no longer able to produce viable offspring. So those are the typical steps. And of course, there are lots of exceptions and lots of finer points to deal with. It's thought that dispersal speciation was the reason why we have so many different species of Galapagos finches. Recall that they have speciated on an island archipelago that's very isolated from the mainland. Vicariant speciation is one of the forms of allopatric speciation, where the landscape or the geography of a species changes around it. And this can happen because of continental drift, mountain building, rivers changing course, etc. And people typically think, ah, oh, this never happens. But it turns out that this is probably a very important force in the creation of new species. It just happens on a very slow time scale. So here's one example. 
the north and south rim of the Grand Canyon, there are two different species of squirrels, and they're pretty similar to each other. But they have been diverged for about 10,000 or so years, and if you're a terrestrial squirrel, it's kind of difficult to get across that big gap. So over that 10,000 year time span, these two species have diverged. A little more realistic than the example that Hank showed in his cartoon video. In sympatric speciation, the two species arise in the same location. There's no geographic separation, and it requires a combination of disruptive selection. Pause here and go back and look at your earlier notes in the class for what disruptive selection was. And also assortative mating. When these two things happen together, then there's a chance that you get sympatric speciation. Assortative mating, remember, is when like individuals choose like individuals to mate with. So there has to be some choosiness. And when this happens, there's a good chance that you can get sympatric speciation. It was thought not too long ago that sympatric speciation was really unlikely, but it turns out that this is probably fairly common too, although not nearly as common as allopatric speciation. Another option is for there to be polyploid speciation. Now this is treated very briefly in the book, and I don't want to get into a lot of details, but I'll just highlight a couple factors here. Polyploid speciation is probably very important in plants. It's estimated that about 30% to 70% of all flowering plants are polyploid. Over 95% of fern species are polyploid. And you're thinking, who cares? I don't care about ferns. But if you eat, like to eat apples, watermelons, tobacco, cotton, wheat, marigolds, snapdragons, coffee, well, maybe you don't eat marigolds, but you like them. For all these species, they have been formed through polyploid speciation events. So lots of things that we're familiar with have been formed due to polyploid speciation. There are really two ways that polyploid speciation can occur. One is autopolyploidy. Autopolyploidy means one species gives rise to one other species. How that happens is through non-disjunction, which produces diploid gametes. Those two diploid gametes fuse together, and then you get an offspring with extra copies of chromosomes. Because those chromosomes do not pair up with their parents correctly, they cannot reproduce with their parent population or their parent species anymore. They have now become a new species and it happens as short as in one generation. This is something that happens pretty commonly in plants because plants don't have developed organ systems and they can easily reproduce with themselves. They are self-fertile. Allopolyploidy means that two different species come together to form a third species. Allo meaning other. So what happens there is gametes come together, they produce a hybrid. During that hybrid's mitosis, Non-disjunction produces polyploid offspring or polyploid cells, and then they produce diploid gametes, not haploid gametes anymore, but diploid gametes. They fertilize themselves, and they have produced a fertile hybrid. We don't need to get into any more of the genetics than this, but I just want you to remember that there are two forms of polyploid speciation, autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy, and both of them require some non-disjunction that produces a polyploid. A lot of people have problems with this idea of macroevolution because they say, well, I've never seen a species come about. Well, it's true. It's difficult to see a species evolve right before your eyes, although it does happen quite a bit. There are some experiments where people have studied bacteria in cultures over the span of just a few dozen years, and during that time, the bacteria undergo thousands and thousands of generations. And sure enough, those bacteria produce different lineages, and the population evolves, and this is now a different thing. But there are other cases of things larger than bacteria where we can observe, probably or likely, the process of speciation happening. So I like to think of these as snapshots of speciation happening. These three other cases are known as subspecies, host races, and ecotypes. And they might be on their way to being true species or good species or species that we can distinguish using something like the biological species concept. One example of a subspecies is something where people recognize substantial enough differences between a species to say, oh, these are different enough, we might start calling them and thinking of them as two distinct lineages or two distinct morphotypes. 
On the left we have the Alabama state bird, the northern flicker, also known as the yellowhammer. And on the right we have the northern flicker. The red shafted flicker, the one on the right, has slightly different appearance, has slightly different call, slightly different coloration. And although it can produce offspring with the northern flicker, the yellow shafted variety, they typically don't do that very often, and so we think of these as two distinct subspecies. They can produce viable offspring, but it doesn't happen very often, so they are distinct enough to warrant subspecies status. Potentially in the future, they will be fully two distinct species. Another possibility of speciation and progress involves host races. Host races are cases where insects or anything else that relies on a host like maybe your gut bacteria, gets so specialized on that one host type that it distinguishes itself and differentiates itself from other similar species. So on the left here we have the exotic species known as the golden rain tree and it was introduced into Florida and other southern states about 60 or 70 years ago. The species up above is a kind of soapberry bug and it feeds on the insides of the seeds of golden rain trees. It also feeds on the balloon vine, which you see below, and the balloon vine is a much larger fruit. Now these bugs feed on the inside of these fruits. Now the seeds are way deep on the inside of this fruit, and so that insect needs a long beak or a long mouth part to be able to chew all the way through there and eat the seeds on the inside. But notice that the golden rain tree fruit is relatively flat and shallow. What insect people have noticed is that if you go back into insect collections long enough, you see two very different lineages or two very different groups of soapberry bugs. Soapberry bugs collected on golden rain tree, the non-native species, tend to have shorter beaks, and those individuals found on balloon vine, the native species, tend to have longer beaks. And if you look at that beak length, it falls into a nice bimodal distribution where there are lots of short-beaked individuals and lots of long-beaked individuals, but not very many individuals in between. So remember one of the first things that's required for sympatric speciation. You need to have disruptive selection. And you can see that this is happening with soapberry bugs. In about the past 60 or 70 years, once this native tree had been introduced, these individual insects started specializing and diverging in their traits. However, it turns out that these are not a distinct species yet because the second thing that's needed for sympatric speciation is there to be positive assortative mating. And as it stands right now, long-beaked bugs and short-beaked bugs will mate with whatever other soapberry bugs they encounter. They're not terribly choosy. But if they did evolve some choosiness, then they could lead to distinctive species formed on their host plants. So finally we have ecotypes. Ecotypes are cases where plants or again other species have adapted to a particular habitat and they be have become a unique geographic variety. They're adapted to particular conditions, the local ecology of that area, it could be elevation, it could be rainfall, it could be temperature, and those individuals like these plants shown here in this figure form different populations and those populations are fairly specialized. They look morphologically different and they have different interactions with other species. It's thought that this could potentially lead to differentiation that's strong enough to produce different species. What we're going to talk about in class is the different reproductive isolating mechanisms that can both lead to these cases of speciation and also reinforce cases of speciation. In other words, keep potential species from breeding together and melding back into one common species.